am here with Arlene, who is, as I was just saying, a kind of spirit sister, scholar, activist, community, um, bridge maker, um, amazing, you know, professor of anthropology, American studies, and um, social and cultural studies there at NYU. Uh, gosh, you did your BA right around when I did mine. I was at Berkeley, you were at Tufts, then you went on to do your MA at NYU and a PhD at CUNY around the same time I was doing my work as well. And we kind of came out and started doing all of our book publishing and teaching and um, our community work. Um, anyway, I'm just so happy that you're here and welcome and let's have a conversation about your work. I'm, I'm so excited to like, just to get to know like why you decided to take this path and how you got here to do re this research and writing on issues of race, gender and space and media, art and pop culture, especially in and around Latinx communities, identities, and experiences? Yeah, well, it, this is the question you could, first of all, thank you. Um, and uh, as we were saying earlier, you know, this is, uh, it's really a joy because we have had, in fact, had these conversations, uh, yet we have not been in a one-to-one. -one. So, uh, which is kind of one of the problems of Latinx studies, right? The fact that sometimes we're working on our own and we have so few opportunities to actually collaborate and converse with one another. Um, uh, but that's another conversation which has to do with, you know, the importance of creating those spaces, those institutional spaces like the Latino Studies Association that has been so great, right? But, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, frankly, to be very honest, I think I've been writing the same book for forever, right? Which it goes back to the issue of kind of like how capitalism works and how culture is shaped under capitalism and the importance of keeping this kind of like political economy and analysis of, of the economies of culture very foregrounded as we think about culture as a domain of politics and representation and cultural politics, right? So is that kind of like knowledge of the power of culture that comes from being attentive to the activism of our communities, whether it's our Puerto Rican community or our New Rican community or Latinx communities, but also ensuring that that conversation um, is informed, that those, that those assessments of culture are informed by uh, an understanding of the travels of culture um, and how culture can impact uh, the definitions of culture, right? The dominant representations of culture and how important it is for us to always as scholars tease out and go beyond, um, go uh, and, and peel the onion, right? Of what, what those uh, projects around Latinidad um, you know, in each, in each particular moment, whether it is in the context of urban uh, politics or in the context of media, um, they're different. I've always been very intrigued in how Latinidad or Latinx pro, uh, studies or Latin definitions of Latinidad are, um, you know, are, are deployed um, and to really excavate who's included, who's excluded in those representations and ultimately be very skeptical, right? of, um, you know, of everything. Um, yeah, no, that's great. So on the one hand, there's, we, there's a lot, there was a lot to celebrate, just like there's a lot to celebrate today, but with the kind of eyes wide open skepticism and maybe even cynicism, because we have to think about like the bigger powers that are operating to package and to profit from the way that like, you know, um, the browning of, you know, America is being used to kind of, you know, basically take dollars out of our pockets, right? Absolutely. And, and also to uh, develop very whitewashed representations. And I know one of the questions you wanted to talk about was about this, this spin, right? This Latin, Latinx, um, you know, the trend, the tendency to whitewash and sanitize um, those representations, but also what's at stake. Right when you have this diminishing, and you know, and I think this is a very important moment because you have a rise of Afro Latinx studies and critical indigeneity, indigeneity mm -hmm. uh, crit critical Latinx indigeneity, and and there's younger generations that are going against that kind of like Latinx, you know, Latinidad as a whitewash project. Um, I kind of was doing that back then, but we didn't have kind of a social movement. Also, those voices were so totally marginalized, and they still are today. But I think that 
what's exciting about this moment is the fact that um, you know we are we're doing Latinx studies at a moment where a lot of the 1990s Latino you know, projects, you know, um, where that were so whitewashed and so devoid of diversity, um, those projects are not possible today, right? Mm -hmm. So we are at a very fruitful moment to be really um, exploring um, these this kinds of issues. So I'm very excited about, you know, this moment. Mm, um, me, me too. Yeah, it's so amazing. Um, the energy of kind of the new generations that are coming up and that we're having contact with and that we're, you know, with um, in these scholarly and also in these um, cultural spaces. So, gosh, you have this great new book um, and um, I am so happy to have and Latinx art and what I love about it. I mean, there's so many things that I love about it and I've only read um, just the first half, but is that you're real, there's a real intentionality here in making sure that we are a community, not just of scholars separate from, but inclusive of our brothers and sisters that are out there making the art, making the culture. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um... I think you know you work in comics, so and, and and with artists, and you know also the importance of not only theorizing cultural products as kind of like texts and things we just read or study, and and we do this kind of textual analysis or even visual analysis of culture, right? But to really step back and, and appreciate the cultural field as a field where people work, they make their living, where there are issues of equity around access around around people being recognized as creators, as cultural workers, and being paid fairly, and being really included in the industries. So those are issues, again, that go back to my previous theorizing, because you know this whole Latino spin, I was so tired of the debates on representation, and I'm like, it's very important to go back to looking at the levels of production and circulation and issues of equity and the economy of all these industries. So that's kind of this book comes about, you know, I said earlier, I've, I've been doing the same book over and over because a lot of the issues around capitalism, labor have always informed that conversation. But in regards to this, yeah, I've been, I've been uh, in New York City since, you know, before I was an academic, I was working in the world of museums and I had met some artists um, who have been in touch with many. And it's, it's kind of frustrating to kind of see how they really don't not benefited at all you know many of them many of our artists are not recognized they're not seen they're not anywhere they're not anywhere visible um and this book was informed both by that history of that realizing how marginalized our artists are but also informed by what i call this growing artivist movement where you have particular young art historians and um, uh, like the U.S. Latinx Art Forum, for instance, you know, organized around like how do we remedy that? How do we carve a space around the Polish Art Association? Um, and realizing that within Latinx studies, there are some fields where the conversation around Latino studies is not developed at all. And one of these spaces is art history, where this space is so whitewashed uh, mm -hmm. that you really don't have artists, Latinx art historians or Latinx, um, very few. So I was galvanized by both um, the movement among young Latinx art historians, also artists like Teresita Fernandez, who I talked about in the book a lot. Her work graces the cover of the book. She organized this Latinx Futures conference at the Ford Foundation that was really generative because it put artists from the East and the West and, and it galvanized the conversation around the fact that, oh my God, you know, this is, you know, we are really invisible in this conversation and what do we need to do to challenge that? So, so the book was, was developed as part of those conversations, particularly um, when I was, uh, I, I was one of the speakers at that convening and I was the only person dealing with matters of the market, um, which to me was really revealing. I was because you know, even though I hadn't done any research on the art market, my research as an anthropologist looking at cultural industries and the market also immediately it tuned me to ask questions about how does the market have to do what does what is the role that the market play in the marginalization of Latinx art? So realizing that I was the only person there, a lot of people came to me and said, "Hey, this is the elephant in the room. 
nobody is really talking about this. Um, and, and I really realized that, that there was a need for me to, to, to really delve to that space, especially because as a scholar, my livelihood does not depend on those issues that oftentimes people in uh, aesthetic industries don't want to talk about. People don't want to necessarily want to address issues of value and money and, and you know, all those issues that we are all uncomfortable discussing. But, you know, if, you, if your livelihood depends on that field, um, more so. So that kind of where that conversation, that's why it, the book also talks a lot about the artists as, uh, and the markets, um, because ultimately, you know, this issue of representation is also an issue of equity in the culture industries. Um, it's also a claim to be, to, to challenge the way that the cultural industries are organized so that, so that Latinx and artists of color are, do not benefit. Um, what are the structural, the policies that we need to, um, this, the ways of thinking, the patterns that, that inhibit and that contribute to racialized and exclusive, um, uh, yeah. So that's kind of um, where that came from was really analyzing um, the plight of artists, you know, and mm -hmm. what are the challenges they face and how can we, um, what do we understand? How can, what can we learn about the art, the contemporary art world if we center their stories, particularly because in the, in the literature of our contemporary art, you will see that the, that the dominant lenses is through the experiences of white or international artists. You don't really have, you have very few um, uh, contem works that deal with the contemporary art market or contemporary art world that, that, that center Black and Latinx uh, artists. So that's kind of what I was trying to do. Um, yeah, no, um, so important, absolutely. And the spaces, um, the spaces that this, the museum spaces, the curated spaces, the exhibit spaces, very often are polarized as well. So you have not only the highbrow kind of spaces that you were just talking about, that gatekeep, but also, um, you know, there's this incredible museum in Florida, right? Um, and that's doing this, you know, curating and exhibiting of this amazing work. And yet, if you talk to someone in New York or maybe on the other coast, LA or San Francisco, they might even just, just dismiss it because it's not right in one of these centers, these cultural so-called centers. Um, let me ask you though, there's also this other really amazing thing that you do, which is, in this book and elsewhere, um, very, very importantly, you're going out and the research and the writing is also showing how we need to be inclusive of a more complex understanding of Latinidad that's inclusive of in our indigenous ancestry yesterday and today, as well as our um, African and African American um, shared kind of values and ancestry. So how does art offer that space for us to see that? Yeah, I, I think the key, um, and, you, and you posed the question on diasporic and art, right? As um, in particular, um, yeah, I mean, for sure, what was fascinating to me uh, was to really see how many of the young generation of artists were uh, creating and doing work that was so um, unapologetically uh, of embracing their, um, you know, Afro Latinidades, um, indigenous, um, and 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 also popular and vernacular culture. They kind of like going to the most, you know. Um, the aspects that we, you know, the, those aspects that are not valued in, in regular dominant culture, you know, they kind of, they were producing really politicized, but also beautiful work that was affirming uh, and that was creating different, uh, embracing different epistemologies of value, really, if you think about that. Um, but also, um, I was very interested in highlighting um, the diasporic and connection and the importance of diaspora creation because when I started this research, there was a lot of debate about what is Latinx and what is, you know, do you have to be born and raised in order in, in the United States, right? Um, that conversation about, you know, that, 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 that reproduces notions of authenticity and how do you begin to highlight who is Latino and who is Latin American, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, and I, and I, I wanted to really think about the example of Puerto Ricans uh, uh, because you know, especially, particularly that's Puerto Rican art, artists as an example, because I found that there's uh, Puerto Ricans, um, I, I found an incredible divide between Puerto Rican art and diaspora Rican artists. They didn't even know each other. There was no relationship between the artists in the diaspora from Puerto Rican background and Puerto Rican artists on the island. And I was like amazed that that dis division existed so much because Puerto Ricans, as you know, are citizens and there's a back and forth. So I imagine that if that distinction happened in the context of Puerto Rico, what do we learn about the plight of other migrant and diasporic and, and um, my, um, other Latinx populations who are similarly, uh, if that distinction of yours in Puerto Rico, imagine the big, the big gap, right, between um, Chicanx, uh, second, third generation Salvadorians. And, um, and I, I wanted to, to really ex uh, go there because I, I'm trying to highlight the importance of engaging in transnational analysis right and the back and forth and the you know the, the, so many of our latinx populations you know um were born in you know are transnational migrants but also to highlight that there's a difference between some of us who have connections with our home countries and are recognized and, and have national privilege and speak the language and are light-skinned versus so many others of of us who, who do not have that national privilege, whether or not they were born and raised on the states or whether they were recent migrants who have, don't have that ability to migrate. Um, I don't know if this makes any sense here, by the way, but, but I'm going, um, um, and I don't even know if I'm answering your question, but I wanted to kind of bring that, uh, bring, bring foreground that neither here or there aspect, right? Um, of Latinidad as so central to, to as, 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 as why it is that we need to come up with like a category of Latinx art to really recognize um, those artists that that are kind of in that lack of recognition and, and are the ones that are most marginalized because they're not recognized by their home countries, they don't have national elites that buy the work, um, and that that's exactly the artists that are most racialized and marginalized in the context of the United States where they're not seen as American artists and they're not, you know, and there's nobody else who would, you know, capture them or like say, yes, we, we, we recognize them. We, we're going to help them. Um, so I don't know if this has mm. anything to do, but, um, and also the fact that within those artists, those were the artists that were doing, you know, I felt really political anti-racist kind of work. And I don't want to generalize because there's a lot of Latin American artists that are also doing that kind of conversation within their own home countries. Um, however, a lot of the, a lot of what we recognize as Latin American art in the context of the United States tends to be the more upper class artists who come to do work here. And then they have a more kind of like Eurocentric disposition. They're not necessarily it's very rare that you're going to have the most disenfranchised black and indigenous Latin Americans coming to study in the American universities art history. So as a result, you do have this distinction between Latin American artists that tend to follow more Eurocentric or European and Anglo-centric genres that are reinforced by the MFA system and artists that are um, you know, from New York City or from the Bronx or from our communities who are, are, are socialized in, you know, as racial minorities. And it's a very different socialization as we know, and it informs their work. So a lot of their work, I'm thinking, for instance, um, Danielle de Jesus, she's, um, she's a, a New York and I believe she's from, from Bushwick and she's now at Yale University. And I was doing a studio visit with her and her work is a love letter to her community, you know? And, and she was telling me how, how she gets this pushback about her work being too narrow or too community and how she was so centered on, no, this is, you know, this is my vision and this is the importance of my work. And I, I think what's fascinating is to see more and more artists that like her are more, um, um, you know, that reject, right? That script that they're told that their work is not valuable. Um, and that's kind of a wonderful thing. Yeah, no, thank you. Really um, 
blowing my mind here with all sorts of um, thoughts about this. Um, sort of talking back and forth. I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's amazing. Um, you know, um, it's this, we see it repeated where um, kind of the marketing industry, um, the spin, the whitewashing, it's, it's okay if it's like from over there and exotic because somehow it's safe. But when it's here in our neighborhood and our communities, um, that you know, it, you know, th that it doesn't know how to handle that. Um, it it feels like a threat. Um, but let me ask, as we kind of move through these questions, um, was there any? Was there a for you in the research, writing, um, interviewing, all of the the work that you did for this book, Collecting Next Art, was there were there any surprises, anything that you were like, wow, I actually thought the opposite. Um, I didn't know this at all. First of all, that's such a great question, first of all. And I mean, the, the number one thing is that everybody knows the art world is a white watch space. And uh, but I, I didn't expect it to be so much, I have to say. And that was one of my... Um, how, how both gallery owners, everybody in power was a white person. And especially because a lot of, you know, we're talking about a lot of the field that was done in galleries in New York City and also in the context of Miami or our Basel and those kinds of art fairs. These are cities where, you know, a great percentage of the population is black and Latinx. And it was to me surprising that the people that were owners and dealers and were kind of in this bubble totally unaware of the city and the population and the demographic realities of the cities in which they live. And then the other big thing was how everybody thought I was talking about Latin American artists. Um, nobody knew what Latinx was, um, especially when I started doing my research two years ago, two or three years ago. But even when I said I spelled it out, these are Latino, Latina, nobody understood what that was. People immediately it, and um, when I asked, they, they gave me examples of Latin American artists they, they had worked with, right? Latin American artists who either born, who are born and raised and that live in, in Latin America were it, it was, the, was the biggest, was a reference point for a lot of the people in the art world about, you know, whether this art is going to look ghetto or is going to be, you know, like, 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 it was almost irreconcilable to think Latinx art and value or innovation or could be in the same plane or in the same conversation. Um, that too was surprising because again, you know, of course we are aware that Latinx people are, they're stereotypes, but people in this, this industry seem to reproduce these stereotypes and conventions very openly. That marketing capitalism, the, the systemic structures that are in place, um, television, um, the whole industry of advertising um, kind of has packaged the way Latinx is in the world. And I just wanted to ask you um, why, why, why it matters to you that we bring this into our classrooms. Of course, I know, um, but maybe for some of the readers and listeners, um, what, what it really means for you. Um. I guess um, I would say two things, you know, um, culture and media, as you know, are huge industries, uh, especially in our mass mediated society. Uh, images matter, they shape our world, they shape our worldview or imagine, you know, our ideologies and everything. So first that, right, the incredible power, ideological power of images and media, but also the fact that these industries are so powerful. Um, multi-millionaire, if you will, industries. Um, and, 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 and again, it goes back to issues of equity that our community be involved in them and that, that we become part of, right? We're not only res, uh, receivers or consumers, but, but that we need to be part of the conversation that shapes these images and that uh, shapes narratives. Um, I think that that's kind of central. Um, that I try to instill on the students too is how they that this is not something that's out there, but something they could have access to, that they could become involved in. Um, I know that's something that you also do with your initiative with high schools, right? That is so important to kind of break this down so that they and I love having speakers, right? People from the industry that that come to and and show to students how they got into these businesses and for them to see grad students that are writing 
and researching this so that they can begin to realize that there are people making these decisions out there um, uh, and that, that, yeah, that they could be part. Um, not everybody needs to be a scholar. We can be, right, we could be activists, cultural activists too in the context of these industries. Yeah, absolutely. Um, got, yep, totally. That's me, me and you, totally yeah. the same. Um, so you mentioned earlier whitewashing um, and, you know, can we, maybe we can talk a little bit about this polarization, right, um, that's happening and we're seeing it right in front of us every day in different ways, whether it's TV or movies or, or uh, Trump, et cetera. Um, but yeah, can, can you talk, could you tell me, like finger on the pulse, how this whitewashing and racialization is kind of taking place today? Well, very simple. You don't see black and brown Latinx people, period. Um, and, you know, it starts in the Spanish language media that it has been decades of people complaining, right, that there's not black Latinx people anywhere, um, indigenous Latinx. And there's so many instances of racialization in this program that I wrote about 20 years ago. And you see them repeated over and over, this fetish for the, for the Latin look. Um, not too light, not too dark, and that really inhibits conversations and not only around look, but also accents. And the real, the real diversity of our community is really not represented. Um, and, you know, it brings issues of colorism in our community. Um, and, and it's really so important that we center that conversation, period, at all levels not only in terms of the media, but also in museums, in exhibitions, in academia. You know, our colleagues at NYU were having this conversation about, hey, we need to really hire Afro-Latinx scholars and Black Latinx. You know, when you think about, you know, our own the community of Latinx studies, right? We don't have, you know, Afro-Latinx studies. It's like a few of them are in any kind of positions of power. Of course, this is a new field, but nonetheless, the fact that they're coming um, you know, so openly and visibly brings attention to the fact that for generations we didn't have Black Latinx scholars, you know, in our community so rarely. This is an issue. Um, uh, same with, you know, Indigenous Latinx, you know. So, so yeah, it's, it's, you know, we're in the midst of a reckoning, right? And what's exciting is to really foreground that the reckoning is not only at the context of mainstream society that excludes us, but how how, what is our responsibility for those of us who, right, who are in this field or producing films or in any industry or doing exhibitions, you know, what is our responsibility to change that, right? Um, what can we do to ensure that we address that lack of representation within our own Latinx institutions? Um, I mean, I think you probably saw this tweet. There was a study that came out that said that Spanish language media was using, they did a study and, and there was a great percentage of number of use of illegal still, as opposed to undocumented by the Spanish language uh, media, written media. You know, what does that tell you? You know, like we cannot, you know, there's, it's impossible that we are not engaging in those issues, you know, in our community and that you know, if you have Spanish language media still using illegal to, to refer to our own community, you know, and, and racialized language that way, we cannot, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that we cannot be challenging mainstream society. Of course, they're racializing us, but we have a lot of homework to do in our own community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it no, absolutely. I'm, I'm with you 100%. Um, you know, we have, even in our own families, right? Um, we have, I have a tia who is very Afro-Latinx, and yet nobody talks about it. Absolutely. You know, um, so, you know, I'm going to kind of move through this because I think we're going to talk about this a little bit in the in the Super Bowl ad. But, you know, here we are, we're majority underrepresented now, um, and yet we're still kind of very fixed in terms of types, the buffoon being hypersexualized, the criminal, the disloyal, the threat. 
Um, but I, I, I want to kind of maybe think about that question in and around this moment in the Super Bowl that everybody was like so excited about when we had Shakira and J-Lo. Um, and maybe um, just, you know, the Arlene kind of reading of this well, I mean, I mean, two things. First of all, because you know, I, for the for the for the Super Bowl, I think Petra Rivera um, did such an amazing critique of that whole you know thing. Um, but I, I want to highlight um, back to your previous um, uh, slide the importance of showing that we we that we foreground we need to be at the table producing, and we need to be mm. at the table because a lot of that what what it means is that. You don't have, we're not in the advertising rooms, we're not making decisions in corporate boards, we're not making decisions in, we need, the only way you're gonna have narratives change is if we actually not normalize these culture industries to look like they should. And that means 80% Latinx, imagine that, 40% people of color. Um, that's the only way you can change that conversation and is, is if you actually have so many, so many of us and our students give the opportunity to change the narrative period. Um, mm. And that's so key. But, but then going back to the whole Shakira and Super Bowl, I mean, what an unfortunate, right, moment um, that speaks to the ways in which capital tends to um, uh, pit up, pit against, you know, pit us against African Americans in particular, because this is a special moment where everybody was so happy about this representation, but at the cost of, right, African Americans, um, which were, you know, boycotting, and that, you know, this, this is not the space for us to be shining and to be unapologetically, the, uh, and, and, and to not being, in, in, to not be practicing politics of solidarity, right? Um, so I think that that's the key element is how do we begin as Latinx people to ensure that we, our claims for representation are done um, in regards to politics of larger solidarity for all people of color and foremost black people, period. Because one of the great things about the Black Lives Matter movement that you see is that it's forcing all of us to really confront the importance of centering anti-blackness as the foundational element of racism in this country that it's seen in our community, in Latinx community too. You can see at this beautiful blonde blue, you know, almost blonde goldish tones that, you know, that represent us, you know, Shakira, J-Lo, you know. Um, so, so yeah, so I guess that that's the one thing that I would say is like, how do we ensure that our claim for representation is not at the cost of that we're constantly, you know, like, um, you know, that, that we celebrate our, that, that, that we need to be working with our African American community, with our black community, with our community of color, um, because changing the industry is the only way, it's not about Latinx representation or Latinx inclusion, it's about people of color inclusion and centering uh, black representations everywhere. Because when you do that, you know, you will have a richer representation of Latinx because you will have finally more black Latinx people visible, right? Mm. So I don't know if this, you know. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah, I know, absolutely. Um, so insightful um, and so important for us to hear. Um, can you, we mentioned, I t we talked really briefly about the importance of teaching. Is there a kind of a, uh, a kind of method or something that's an you know your trademark in the classroom none except i learn from students i'm sure you do too mm. we mm. all know what they're watching what's exciting what mm. they're most happy about um i think that that's kind of right like uh, that that's how i begin to teach is basically to have that conversation with them um and not only Latinx pop culture, I love doing race and ethnicity, this kind of comparative, right? And it, the class has always been mainly people of color in the class. And it's so great to have both uh, the black students with the Latinx students and the Asian students and few Native American students that also join in to, to really have this kind of comparative conversation, you know? Um, and it, going back to our earlier point, it goes back to the same issue about how do we become anti-racist 
you know, and solidarity politics. And a lot of the research in ethnic studies has traditionally been very much like Asian Americans in the media, Latinx in the media, right? African Americans in the media. And, and we need to be really doing more kind of like race in the media, you know, conversation mm -hmm. and really highlight what are the issues that affect all of our communities um, and center on those, you know, on white privilege, which is the one thing that we all need to struggle and fight for together, right? Absolutely. So to do in the class. Um, can you share a little bit about, um, as founder and director of the Latinx Project, um, you know, what the aims and goals and, and the why, I guess. I mean, in many ways, you've sort of told, you know, everything you do is the why, but um, in, an, in a nutshell. Well, I, I, the thing is, the, the key thing here is that it is kind of embarrassing that there was not a space at NYU for Latinx studies. Um, and that's kind of like, that's the why. Um, NYU has thriving in institutes that have been operating for 20 years or more, Institute for African American Studies, Asian Pacific American Studies, um, oh my goodness, uh, Hemispheric Studies, uh, King Juan Carlos Center of Spain, and there's all of these other institutes, Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, you name it. Um, and then of course you have the Italian house, yeah all these other houses, but there was no Latinx space at all. Um, and this had huge consequences because we didn't have any funding for any kind of programming. Um, in fact, Latinx studies as a space, all we had was a major, but we didn't even have um, any kind of budget at all for programming. And I, I know that this will surprise a lot of people who, who are surprised at NYU, right? And when we had so many famous faculty, uh, Jose Munoz or Juan Flores. And the fact is that no, you know, we, we had a lot of Renato Rosaldo. We never really had any kind of um, funded institutional space for Latinx studies at all. Um, and that meant that, meant that, that um, we really couldn't have conversations or any kind of programming that was not through some of the other institutes, but based on their funding or co-sponsorship, but it was not a Latinx directed space. So this came about when I had the opportunity to ask for some kind of um, retention that I asked for some money, you know, like a little funding thing, there's not that much, but I immediately got it to work into what you see now when I began to fundraise um, because I knew that there was just, it was my responsibility. And I think all of us who are senior faculty, um, in a way, I think, I think, um, you know, you know, the university was never, ne was never investing in this space. So many of us felt like, you know, we have all the things to do. Let's work on our research because let's face it, institutional, institutional, uh, institution building is a lot of work. And, you know, uh, universities needs to, need to reward faculty to do that kind of work. Uh, when that's not happening, it comes to the point when some of us, it's like, it's, it's embarrassing to be in a space that doesn't have this. It, Somebody has to do this, let me do it. It's got, it's got to be, it, you know, tiene que ser. You know what I mean? It was like, there was no other way out. And to me, so I saw it very clearly like that. It was like, I had to do it, I had the opportunity, but also it was informed by almost decades, you know, so many of us have been clamoring and in conversations, you know. I remember when both Jose and Juan were, were alive, we even had a working document for proposal for Latinx studies that, go, that went nowhere, you know. But there was a lot of intelligence and there was a lot of kind of like we, I, I knew, I knew that I kind of, I, I knew what, I, what we had to do. Does that make sense? Um, but I also realized that the reason why it grew and it became what it became was because also I had the kind of freedom of just doing it within the context of, you know, of just some funds. Because universities are really good at doing all these kind of planning committees that never lead anywhere. So anybody who hears this, stay away from planning committees. You know, they usually are a way of like ex getting you exhausted and not doing anything and, and lingering for, for ages. So we started, um, you know, and, and we started with exhibitions because I was doing the Latinx art book and I knew that it was so important to have artists because a lot of the other institutes have had artists, but because we didn't have a Latinx Institute, we could never host a Latinx artist. So NYU was part of the same problem that I was writing about, right? The fact that the lack of institutional spaces to host artists was affecting the understanding and recognition of Latinx art. So 
so that's how it all started. And um, most importantly, um, it's great that, you know, we are able to support now three artists in residence. We have already done four exhibitions. We have three planned for the year, even though they're going to be virtual. And it's so exciting to be able to, to do that, right? Um, exhibitions that, that, of course, can be have a pedagogical element, our faculty can use, our students can use, but most importantly, the universe can use because they will be housed in the website and are a resource for people to know um, about our artists, at least visual artists. Well, it's amazing what you're doing and what you've done and achieved. And, um, and I know you've got a lot of uh, folks there working alongside you, but, um, but yeah, it's remarkable. It's really remarkable. Um, I have to say it's all artists. You know, we started with Barbara Calderon, Paul Mourinho is also an artist. David um, is not an artist, but he's a writer. And then, and our faculty board also, who as you know, is, we know, I always say we have the best Latinx studies faculty, but then again, you know, we have so many great people in Latinx studies. So, um, so it is, it is, and also once you get an artist to do something, you know, they're going to be brilliant, right? That's the other thing is that, um, and we're also very happy. Um, we have Janelle Martinez. I don't know if you know her from Ent I Latina. Uh, she's an Afro Latinx, uh, Garifuna, folk producer and entrepreneur. She's going to be joining our team next week. So, so we were able to to create another position. So, so yeah, it's it's exciting. It's exciting to to, to that that the, that the team is growing and that a lot of the team comes from community comes from the community, but it's also very tied to our larger community too. These are not. Nobody who's working with us is an administrator per se. They're all activists, artists, or cultural entrepreneurs, and that's so important, you know? Absolutely. The, uh, the vision, the implementation, the, the results, everything are just like mind blowing. Um, and my next question, where is the heartbeat for Latinx cultural studies today? Um, in a way, you're kind of answering that with everything that we've just talked about um, again. But um, yeah, where where would you say it is? I think, I think uh, you know, the younger generations, period. I'm very excited about the anti-racist thinking of our Afro-Latinx community, of critical race theory being centered, um, uh, all the conversation around uh, against gender binaries and the whole Latinx conversation as a project. Um, challenging gender binaries and thinking about new epistemologies. I mean, there's a lot there that is exciting. Um, but in terms of practical conversations, I think the digital world and public humanities ensuring uh, we are we are kind of at a moment where we could finally fulfill the mission and, and the vision of Latinx studies in the beginning, 40 years ago, or you know back in the you know like in 69, 70, that connection with communities that nowadays is so much is made so much easier and facilitated by social media for instance um and by digital you know digital publications and digital resources that 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 facilitate um accessibility of our work so i think that that's the most ex the, what i'm most excited about is how is is the, the 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 fact that we live in a world where our research can in fact be more accessible to communities um, and also seeing how new generations are becoming so savvy about being on Twitter, talking to each other, creating alternative communities. Um, in a way, I feel that so many of the conversations around disciplines and conferences are so passe, right? Vis-a-vis mm. um, -vis the kind of, you know, um, excitement of ethnic studies and interdisciplinary spaces and also in social media through those spaces. So, so I think I think that that's kind of the heartbeat if you, you know, the conversations mm -hmm. are coming from that are less mediated um, than in the past would have been when there were editors or, you know, people had to go to conferences to present. I think that there's more of a accessibility. Of course, you know, I should say I'm a food professor and, you know, there's people that, you know, social media can also be a, a double edit sword in terms of not every not everybody it's not accessible to everybody the way that we'd like to to think it is you know there's a lot of um 
um, how do you call this um, hostility and you know there's a lot of issues that um, but but I but I think this 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 realization that our research has to be accessible and that it's what I'm most excited about you know young generations that are not only doing a book they're doing a, a website for their for their thing um, scholars that are not writing it but they're also thinking of an exhibition um, this kind of constant um, accountability that more and more all of us have like uh, this is a good example you know we don't just do a conference we have to tape it we have to record it right um, we have it has to be archived somewhere um, you know that is kind of key you know that you know now through the Latinx project for instance you know we have been taping everything I have no idea what's in that tape but you know it's there um, and I know some people have accessed it so I think that that's kind of um, you know, that kind of public humanities element that everybody should have access to. Because in, in the past, and this is the last thing I'll say, back in the 70s, there were so few of us, right? If you remember, a lot of the projects were really about research centers, right? That created research. And, um, and a lot of the old Latino studies, like if you think about the Inter-University Association of Latino Centers, I, you know, I forget the, the acronyms, the... Inter-American University Center for, you know them, right? The consortiums of early Latinx studies centers and institutes founded in universities operated around the notion of creating research and surveys. And a lot of research centered. They were research centers, you know, and they had components that had to do with, but, but they were created at a moment when there were few academics. So there was a need to do research. Nowadays, we have course we need to have more academics but there's there's a lot more of us and I think the biggest need is in translating that research to communities because a lot of us are producing work but how do we ensure that that research is translated and circulated and that people have the ability to present their work and talk to audiences and reach that kind of is what I think is most needed now because a lot of us you know look at us we haven't been able to talk to each other right Maybe this conversation, when it comes out, will be, right, will enrich somebody else or will inspire a grad student, right? Um, that's what I think most exciting right now is the fact that our research is not only about research, getting tenure, and that's the end of it, but that more and more there's this impetus for translating and ensuring that work gets, is accessible, whether it is through a, through a tweet, or a tweet thread, or an opinion piece, or this conversation, or just even like people are doing IG live combos, so they're book talks, you know? Um, so I think that that's, you know, I'll leave it at that, right? Um, yeah, no, I'm totally in agreement. And I think that the social media um, and the digital spaces allow for, well, they're, they're tools, they're, they're ways that we can do this now that we just didn't have before. Um, Arlene, thank you. This has been like amazing. Um, I, my brain is just like going nuts right now. And thank you. Thank you so much.